Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church here in Pont de My name is Kyle, if you don't know, and I am the youth pastor. <laughs> Wonderful to see you guys this morning. Now, if you are new here, the reason people are laughing is because sometimes I say, hello, my name's Kyle, I'm the youth pastor. And for some reason, people find that really funny now. But it is true, I, I do work here. Um, but it's great to see you guys today, um, whether you have been coming for years and years and years, or whether you are um, here for your first week. We're hoping you have a great time here today. Um, we're going to get straight into it in a bit, but I've just got two announcements to share with you. Um, tonight at 6 p.m. is our first um, evening service with Andy Phillips speaking. We're going to have a time of worship together. So if you're free for that, 6 p.m. here at Bethel, we'd love to see you here. The second one um, is if someone's birthday today is a special 70th birthday to Dan. So we'd like to say a special happy birthday to Dan and a nice round of applause. There we go. Happy birthday, Dan. Um, but yeah, why don't we stand together? We're going to worship Jesus now together. Um, and then I'm going to um, share with you guys a bit later. But also, we've got communion as well. So if you've got your cups um, from the reception area, then that's great. But if you haven't got them, then um, maybe raise a hand or go and get them quickly. But let me pray for you guys before we get into it. Jesus, we thank you so much that we're able to gather here today, Lord. We thank you that you want to speak to us that you want to come and have your way in this place, that you want to pour out your love onto the people that you love so much. So yeah, Jesus, we just invite you now. Amen. 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 Stay standing if you're able. We're going we're gonna to worship. We're going to sing Joy of the Lord.
sounded amazing. Um, I'm going to release the children now and um, I'm going to pray for them as they go out. Um, yeah, Father God, we just thank you for these children, for each and every one of them. We pray that you'd bless them. We pray that you'd um, raise them up to be uh, warriors in your name, Father God. We pray that you would fill them with knowledge of you and, and belief in you and trust in you. And we pray that they would do amazing things in your name. Amen. <clears throat>
felt the Lord speak to me about somebody here. Um, I could be wrong. Um, you were singing the first song, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But you feel weak. And you know you haven't got any joy in your heart. But you want that joy. You want to feel strong. God is saying, I am here for you. My arms are open wide. Come to me. I will give you strength. I will give you joy in your heart. If that is you this morning, please, I'd love to pray with you. Okay? And if you, anybody else who you know to be a Christian would also love to pray with you. But please, don't turn this away. If that's you this morning, please come to, to the Father.
Yeah, Jesus, we just thank you that you are here, Lord, that you want to speak to us today. Just coming out of your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Like I said, if it's your first time um, and you don't really know what's going on and you're quite new to church, all we're doing in that is just worshiping God, um, singing songs, just like when we'd go to a concert. Um, I remember 2016 going to see Justin Bieber. Um, do I look like the Justin Bieber type? Yeah, I do, I know. Went to see Justin Bieber in um, the Principality Stadium and you have your hands in the sky, don't you? Know, blasting the music because you, you like Justin Bieber. Now we do that in church because we love God and we love Jesus and, he, and he's changed many of our lives. So if you're wondering what that was, that's just us um, worshiping Jesus today. Um, what I'd love to do though is I'd love to just share a prayer with you guys. Um, and if you agree with that, I'd love for you to say amen. When we say amen in church, it just means we agree. Um, so I just wanna read something because I believe that God wants to speak to people today. And this is only four lines. So if you wanna close your eyes and I'm just gonna read something. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only you can do. Jesus, have your way in me now. Amen. Amen. So I am talking about foundations today and it's great that the band played Firm Foundation by Bethel Music to get us ready for that today. And I'm really excited to be sharing this message with you guys today because I believe it's really important for people wherever they are in their journey, whether you've been following Jesus for years and years and years or whether you've, been, um, you've never followed Jesus, you don't follow Jesus, maybe you don't even believe in a God. But I believe this message is for all of us today. Um, and all I'm doing today is sharing what I believe God has said to me and what he wants to say to his church this morning. Is that okay with you guys? Good, good. So I've titled um, my message today, Disrupt the Ground. Disrupt the Ground. Now, I heard this quote on Friday by one of my friends and it got me thinking about what Jesus wants to say to us. Um, so yeah, I hadn't wrote anything until Friday night. I was still waiting to see um, what God wanted to say. And then I heard that and then um, the message was just coming together around what God wants to say to, to you guys today. So disrupt the ground. Some of our foundations look secure, but are fragile. Some of our foundations are eroding away. Some of our foundations have scaffolding around it. And I wanna explore that, what does that mean? What does it mean for our foundations to look different? What, is, what does foundations even mean? What does that mean for, for people who follow Jesus? But what does that also mean for people who have never set foot in church as well? I hope I'd be able to communicate that for you guys today. But I wanna look at destructing the ground in terms of our foundations and what, what we've built, what have we built over the years in terms of being a Christian, but also never knowing Jesus as well. So I'm gonna read from the Bible, is in one of the Gospels, and it's Matthew chapter seven. I'm reading from verses 24 to 27. And it says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And I just wanna unpack that today in terms of our foundations, in terms of being a Christian. Now I know everyone, every single person here today is on a different journey. Some of us have been around church for years and years and years. For some of us, it might be the first time. For some of us, we might be in that middle ground of exploring that. But I think it might be helpful for me to put a bit of context into what I just shared now. So that was Jesus speaking to his disciples and mainly talk, um, talking to Jewish people as well. And the Gospel of Matthew, one of the books in the Bible there, was written mainly for the Jewish audience. So it was written for the Jews. They didn't know Jesus, but um, they were, were believed in a God, but they just didn't believe that Jesus was, was God. So the book was written for them, basically. 
And Matthew clearly thought that this story had some relevance to this, this situation. And what I love about the Bible is authors are always hitting the head on the, like the nail. They know like what to say to the people that they are writing the book to. So they must have thought that houses must have had some sort of relevance to the Jewish people, to the disciples, to all the people in the first century. What was going on back then? And Jesus is letting people know that listening to what he says has the utmost importance. If we believe Jesus is the Son of God, then the, the importance of Jesus is incredible. But if, we've never, if we don't believe in a God, then Jesus doesn't have any importance as, as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, Jesus either has the most importance or no importance at all. So Jesus, like I said, Jesus letting the people know um, that it's important to listen to what he's saying. In the first century, the foundations of houses were a problem. Now, we live in the 21st century, so we've sort of been able to develop on how our houses look, and now we're at a stage where most houses are pretty good, pretty, pretty stern. Um, if a storm comes, we're still doing okay. Um, but back then, that was a problem for the first century. And a Bible commentator said, commentator said, they gave some stability, but homeowners would be constantly doing maintenance on their house. And like the first century people, I believe there are people in this room that need to reflect on their foundations. I think God wants to disrupt the ground that we are standing on because some of the ground that we're actually on, some of the foundations that we have are not so secure as we thought they might be. What do our foundations look like? What do your foundations look like? Are we looking at other people and sort of critiquing how their foundations look and then forgetting about what our foundations look like? Or do we know where we're at? Do we know where our foundations are? Are we built on the rock or are we built on the sand? So to disrupt means to drastically alter or destroy the structure of. And I believe some of us need to drastically alter our foundations, the very core of what we are standing on today. Some of us need to put a scaffolding back up on our houses. Some of us need to rebuild. Some of us need to go again. Some of us need to reflect on how our foundations are. And I want to say to you guys that if we do have scaffolding on our house, that's okay. It's okay to be in the process of rebuilding, relooking. It's better to have scaffolding on our house than to have a mansion on the sand. You may look broken to the world with your scaffolding on trying to work out this faith, trying to work out what it looks like to follow a God in this world. But God sees you. He sees your hard work and the rebuild of the foundations. And some of us need to reflect on our foundations today and see whether we need to destroy the structure and start a rebuild. So in terms of the world then, what voices do we listen to? What type of people do we listen to? We've been in the schools over the last few weeks and we do this um, conversation with the guys looking at influences. So what type of influences do we have in the world? And people are saying, you know, parents, teachers, friends. Some of them say like some famous people on Instagram that we don't have a clue who they are. Um, but they're always talking about influences and we're saying like how important it is about what influences we have. We can have really positive people in our life, but we can also have really negative people in our life as well. And we do live in a world that's broken right now. And we've got to be really careful about the voices that we do listen to. Whose voice is influencing us the most? Where do we find our moral compass? What voices influence that? How do we work out what we think is right, what we think is wrong? what we think is worth committing our life to, what we don't think is worth committing our life to. How do we work that out in a world that is broken? So I want to spend a few minutes quickly looking at that. So I had a chat on Friday with two people who, I don't know if they believe in Jesus, but they're not Christians. And when you're a Christian and you're chatting to people who are not Christians, they usually ask you the questions um, that you don't really want to answer because they're difficult ones. So we ended up talking about um, the LGBTQ plus community, um, but we also talked about the Supreme Court decision to make abortions illegal as well. And it was a good conversation. It was really um, deep. If you like deep conversations, it was a deep conversation. But I was able to unpack why I believe, why I believe this thing. 
and they were able to understand that. And I came away from the conversation thinking that I'd, I'd done a good job, but I'm also saying, can we do this every week? Because sometimes as Christians, we won't answer those questions because we're scared of what the response will be. And what I believe is, I don't think the response will be as scary as we think. I think the majority of those conversations that we have with people will be okay, will be good. And I, I seen a quote yesterday that says, we serve others well when we share the whole gospel with them, not just the parts deemed attractive by our culture. And I wonder if some of us have conformed to the patterns of the world in our conversations when people ask us things. We go on to their side of it because we're scared about the response. You see, the voice of culture is a lot easier to hear than the voice of God. And the voice of our feelings is a lot easier to hear than the voice of God. You see, we live in a world where our feelings matter. And I'm not here today to say they don't matter. But we put a big emphasis on our feelings, especially my generation and the ones around my age. We really value our feelings and we make a lot of choices based on how we feel rather than the truth. And that's really important for you guys if you've never heard that before. Sometimes we make choices based on feelings rather than truth. And that can be really dangerous because I can wake up sometimes feeling really sad, really bored of life, like I've had enough. But then I can wake up the next day and feel really happy because feelings constantly change, but the truth never does. We also need to be mindful on how we love people. There's a quote going around on social media right now, and I typed it on on Twitter, and it came up straight away. Loads of people are, are posting it. And they're saying that there's no hate quite like Christian love. There's no hate quite like Christian love. Hmm. And if that shouldn't affect us as Christians, because something's going wrong here, because the love that I know from a God that's given me it's not a hateful love. It's an unconditional love. But people in society now are thinking that this love is a hateful love. And obviously as people we fail and we fall short, but we've got to be really careful when we're talking about these topics and different things and sharing with people. Of course we want to share our faith, but we've got to be careful on what we share. Are we sharing in love? Are we showing that person unconditional love? Or are we just bashing our ideas across to other people? This is what I believe, this is the truth, this is what I stand for. Now absolutely share your faith, but be careful, because it's a generation of people that believe we're haters. And that's the truth. That's what people think about some of the church right now. And that's worrying and that's concerning for me. And I don't just mean Bethel as a church, I mean the church in terms of the world. Somewhere along the line, we've done something. We've fallen short of God's standard for us. Even in terms of just loving. There's no hate quite like Christian love. No, I don't want to see that on social media. I don't want to be part of an organization and a, a movement of God where people think that we're hating on people when we are called as the church to love. Now, I believe that does have some importance to do with foundations as well, though. Because if we are hating on people who are not Christians, then somewhere in our foundation is not rooted on the rock. Because the rock is love, Jesus is love. So if we're not rooted in Jesus, then something's gone on. Something wrong's happened and we, and we, may, not, we may think we're on the rock, but we're not. Because if you've ever shown hate to someone, if you've ever disliked someone, we need to have a rethink. You know, I've fallen short so many times in doing that when we want to say our ideas, our beliefs, and get them across because they have strong opinions and we have strong opinions as well and then you clash. But I wonder how Jesus would have handled it and I wonder what Jesus would have done if he was seeing this quote when he was on earth. There's no hate quite like Christian love. Going back into the story then of Matthew 7 and the rock and the sand, there's a quote from Spurgeon which says, the wise and the foolish man achieved the same design to a considerable extent. Now I find this really interesting, so listen. Both undertook to build houses. Both persevered in building. Both finished their houses. 
the likeness between them is very considerable. So they look the same. They work just as hard as each other. The houses might probably look the same, but there was one key difference. The one was built on the rock, and one was built on the sand. And I wonder if we can relate to this a bit, where we come to church, and, and we're in our prayer meeting, or we got our hands in the sky, we're worshiping, and we all look the same, and we all look like we're following God. But I wonder what's in here. I wonder what our heart actually looks like. Because a house can look incredible, but what's in it is what counts the most. You know, you could buy a mansion, but if it didn't have any doors, walls, ceilings, one, one story, no bed, then it'd be pointless. And that's why I understand why God is always talking about the inward appearance being the most important thing. And I understand that in terms of relationships as well, that being the most important thing. Because that fades, doesn't it? Looks change. Houses grow older. And what was good in the moment, in the time, what's good in the 21st century will probably be really outdated in the 22nd century. So I wonder if some of us look like a Christian, act like a Christian, but our houses are built on the sand. It's about who we are standing on. It's not about the person we are, although if we are standing on the rock, our actions will change. We will be different. We will be inspired by God to do different things. Some of us have spiritual mansions but are built in the sand. To people you look like you're succeeding, but God see what's going on inside the house. You see, when I was in Bible college, I needed to get, find a job, and my, dad, my dad's boss asked me if I wanted a job, and it was laboring, so going on to like work sites and just being there, I don't know what the right word is really, carrying stuff for people, maybe being able to use a screwdriver, but that was really the case. Um, so I done my CSCS card, which is like what you need to get onto the site, I know I don't look like someone who works on the site. I only done it for a few weeks. Um, but we were, we were building a um, Spoons, a pub in um, Wolverhampton Way. And they were building the house or the, or the pub from the outside. And the walls were going up really quickly. And then when we'd go to get food at lunchtime, say we go to the chip shop or Greg's or, or wherever we'd go, we never eat healthy. Um, people would always ask us, the pub's surely opening soon. It looks ready. It looks ready. It must be ready to open soon. You know, they had painted the outside. They had built new walls. The garden was looking ready. But the inside was nowhere near. There was, work, there was people working so hard to get that done. But although the outside looked done, the inside had a lot of work to do. And I wonder if that can be helpful for some of us today. Where we look like we're doing okay. We look like we're following Jesus well. But what's in the house is what counts the most. And where the house is, where it's planted, is so important as well. So what does your house look like from the inside? What would you, what would you rate your house out of 10? Not in terms of how many windows you've got or how many doors. But what does it look like inside? What would Jesus say if he came into your house? When Jesus says, um, when the rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard that story before, and we always link it to storms in our life, don't we? Like, you know, Jesus is saying, when the storms come, our house will be secure because it's built on him and built on the rock, something that will never move, something that's um, never changing. And that is true. He is talking about storms in our life. But going back to what he was trying to communicate to the audience that he was talking to, is that in that, in that century, they didn't have anything like nuclear weapons. They didn't have guns. So they were most concerned about the weather. That was the most thing that they were worried about, because the weather is what would turn their world upside down. Now, we've got a lot more worries than just the weather now, haven't we? Our houses are looking good, you know, we've got cars, we've got all these different things. So when the weather does change, when the weather is, a ba is bad, it doesn't really affect us. But back then in the first century, when the weather was going crazy, that was the worst thing imaginable. And what Jesus was saying to the people is the worst thing in your life that could ever happen 
won't affect you, won't move you if you were placed on the rock. Now we can read that and just be like, oh, it's just weather. But what he was saying to them is no matter what comes, even the worst trial, even the worst thing that could happen in your life, if you were placed on the rock, you will not move. And I found that really interesting because we can all relate to storms in our lives, but some of us have gone through some horrendous things. But Jesus said, if we are built on the rock, we will not move. We'll feel it. You know, when an earthquake comes, we'd feel it, but the house would be secure. Even in your worst moment, if you were built on the rock, you won't fall. Even in your darkest day, if you were built on the rock, you won't fall. Even in the lowest valley, if you were built on the rock, you won't fall. Even now, in this moment, we can disrupt the ground. We can change the foundations. It's not about how we look. It's about where we are planted. So how do we disrupt the ground we are standing on? Make sure our foundations are secure. I've got three really quick points. Just, they're really quick. So the first one is, ask someone what they think about your faith. Someone you trust. Someone you know that will give you an honest answer. In the book of Proverbs, in the Bible, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So if you want to find out what people think about your faith, ask someone you trust. If you ask an honest person what they think about your faith, you might get an answer you don't like. But another person can help you to grow, to start the process of scaffolding the house and rebuilding. Number two, ask God what he thinks. I know I'm coming at you with a lot of quotes there and I've got another one. I seen it a few weeks ago and it said, if you're bored with your faith, so is God. So if you're bored with coming to church, if you're bored with reading your Bible, if you're bored worshiping, then God is probably bored with your faith as well. Because God's limit is endless. So if we're only standing by you, he's probably quite bored of where we're at. And if we're not moving, if we're not going, if we're not going to the next part of what God is, is asking us to go to, he's probably bored as well. Maybe ask God, who are my foundations in? Again, you might not like the answer you have. You might say that you're rooted in a culture that is so obsessed with feelings, the truth is being clouded, that you can't see what's going on because the culture is the roots of your foundation. Last one then, open the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God breathed. What is the Bible saying to you? You know, as Christians, we believe that the Bible is the word of God, that it was written thousands and thousands of years ago, but still has relevance today. Still wants to speak today. Can still challenge us today. Don't ne neglect God's word. It's not enough to be content with living on the sand, because I believe there's so much more if we live on the rock. Not just security, but a life like no other. And sometimes we need to dig up the ground to lay some new foundations, which means it's going to be ugly, it's going to be messy, but it grows us and it shapes us. So disrupting the ground, building the scaffolding, strengthening our foundations, it's hard, right? And some of us might be thinking, where are our foundations? Who are they rooted in? And that's good to question that. If we have some scaffolding on our house right now, that's good. It means we're growing, it means we're moving. But the best thing we could ever to do is disrupt the ground, see what's going on. Where are our roots? Where is our foundation? What is God saying to you? And now if you don't know Jesus, that's absolutely fine. I'm so glad you're here today to be able to um, join us as Christians who do believe in a God. Now this can apply to you as well because I believe Jesus wants to share his love to all people. Not a hateful love, a love like no other. And he wants you to be rooted on the rock. And all that means is to have a secure relationship with him. And that's what he offers to every single one of us, whatever we're feeling like today, whatever week we've had, whatever day we've had, whatever the morning's been like. 
There's a God that offers us a relationship with him. And there's nothing better. So I'm going to pray. And I'm going to invite the band to come back up. I think um, some of us are feel like we're sinking in the sand and some of us are close to giving in maybe on the faith maybe in following Jesus and I believe God was saying to wait because he wants to speak to you so I'm going to pray into that Jesus I pray for anyone right now who's experiencing a really tough time right now that they're feeling like there's no way out, Lord. I pray that you'll just meet them right now where they are, that they will know that they are loved, that they are cherished, that there's a God that will love them no matter what. May they experience that now. And Jesus, we just pray as we go into a time of worship and communion now, that you'll continue to speak to us that our hearts will be moved to action, to rebuilding our foundations, to being secure in a God that loves us so much. So we're gonna ask Paul to come and do communion before we sing our final song together. Good morning. Um, thanks for that, Kyle, that word, Kyle. It's good. I think it's important that sometimes we disrupt the ground, isn't it? And just now let's think we carry on as we always have. But I think God has so much more for us. Um, just to be sure, has everyone who needs communion got communion? Okay, we'll get you in. There we are. Uh, anybody else? There we are. If there's anybody, nobody else, that's fine, that's good. You know, if, if, if you're watching today, whether you're in church and you wonder why we take communion, it's not because we're religious. It's not because it's a religious act that we have to do every week or every month. It's simply because it reminds us of what Jesus did for us. It reminds us of his body and his blood, which was broken and shed for us over 2,000 years ago. And it's good to know that that blood that was shed over 2,000 years ago hasn't lost its power. And as we come around the table, if it was a table there, um, I would say to you this morning, let's not get too familiar with taking communion. Let's not take communion just again with the bread and with the wine or the juice, whatever it might be. But let's take it this morning like it's the first time again. When we actually have a realization of Jesus dying on our cross for you and for me. And to remember this morning, although we're taking communion, there's still power in the blood. So whatever we are looking or asking God for, seeking God for at this time, the power hasn't gone down at all. It's still at full capacity. It's still as powerful. So I'm going to pray and then I'm going to read. Sorry, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians and then we'll pray and then we'll take the communion. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we take the bread together? Thank you, Lord. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take of the wine together.
For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, this morning that we don't serve a dead God. We thank you, Lord, this morning that we serve a God, Lord, which is very much alive. We thank you, Lord, that you died first on our cross, but, Lord, we thank you that you rose again that third day too. We thank you, Lord, for the life you give to others. And we pray this morning, Lord, as we have taken this bread and we have um, drunk of this juice, Lord, the wine, Lord, I just pray, oh God, that you would fall afresh on us. In this place this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, I was going to say, if you stand if you're able, but you know what, if you're still um, thinking about these things and you're still um, praying about them, then you just be comfortable. If you want to stand and worship, that's great. If you want to you want to reflect for a bit longer or um, get somebody to pray with you that's that's wonderful too so we're going to sing um see a victory
Jesus, we believe that we're going to see a victory, Father God. We believe that the battle is yours, Father God. We believe that while we might be knocked, Lord Jesus, while it might go dark, while it might be storms, while it might be rain, Lord Jesus, our foundation is on you. And you will not be moved. You will not be shaken. You will not be defeated. You will not fall. And if our, if our house is built on you, Lord Jesus, if we built our lives on you, Lord Jesus, we will not be shaken, Father God. Not because we're strong, but because we're trusting in you and you are strong. You are mighty. Yeah, Father God, we, we believe it, Lord Jesus. And I just pray for the people who are in this room right now and they're going through some kind of battle, Lord Jesus. And I don't know everybody's circumstances, but you do, Father God. You know about the battles that are going on in these rooms, Lord, Father God. The battles that are going on for people who are at home too, Father God. And some of them will be public battles that we'll know about and some of them will be private battles, but you know about them all. And Lord Jesus, I just thank you that you will have victory, Father God. I, I pray that everybody in a battle, Father God, will know that you are with them. They are not alone. And you are mighty. And you will not be defeated, Lord Jesus. We pray that our trust in you isn't something that we just sing about, Father God, or just talk about on a Sunday. Our trust in you is a very real and unshakable thing. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you'd bless us now in the next week, Father God, whether we're going through battles or whether we're going through seasons of joy. Father God, I pray that you would be at the center of it all. In your precious mighty name we ask. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. That is church. Um, it's great to see you guys. Please stick around um, to just chat. Please come and chat to me. I'd love to chat to you. Um, I think there's, there's some refreshments in the coffee lounge as well. And if you'd like some, um, some prayer, we'd love to pray for you as well. So there'll be a few guys at the front um, if you want to come and receive some prayer. But service tonight, Sunday evening, 6 p.m. And if not, see you next week. Have a great week. <laughs>